Thank you so much for, for turning up so early on a Friday morning. I know it's no mean feat. Um, in fact, I've actually been awake for the past couple of hours, freaking out that I might just fall asleep. Um, so I'm not a morning person, big disclaimer here. Um, some of my colleagues sitting here have never seen me awake at this hour. So yeah, when I was asked to speak at Creative Mornings, I was like, oh man, OK, this is going to be fun. And this is the kind of stuff that Alanis Morissette sings about. Um, OK, so when I was preparing this talk, I was wondering what to talk about. And I had to look deep into my soul, you know, trying to figure out what do I know that I can share with you all? What can I offer as advice to everyone? So it's like, hmm. So today, I'd like to talk to you about the nine reasons why there's no classy way of posing with a fake rhinoceros. Because if there's one thing I know to be true, it is this. I speak from experience. <laughs> It's just, it's so awkward, you know? It's like, where do you put your hand? <laughs> and you'd think that this is one of those things that you just get better with age, like you figure it out, but clearly you don't. You know, it's just like, it just, it just does not work out for some reason. Okay, this is not my talk, by the way. Um, when I was preparing for this talk, my mom sent me a bunch of photos, and I figured I have to use these somewhere, so I thought I'd throw it in. I'm a communication designer at IDEO. Some of you may or may not have heard about us, but about 30 years ago, our founders designed the first commercial mouse for Apple. In that time, we've, we've used our human-centered process to design everything from products to services to experiences to entire complex systems. And I'll give a couple of examples. Um, this was a nurse knowledge exchange program that we designed for a large hospital network in the US, where we managed to reduce the amount of errors that happen during the, the shift, the, the time shift of nurses in the evenings, um, increase the overall efficiency of, a, of the hospital, and actually make patients feel really comfortable throughout this process. We've also worked on really complex systems, like designing a school system for the emerging middle class in Peru. Um, and we've actually informed everything from the architecture to the business model to the, to the curriculum of the school itself. To the, to the way the teachers are trained. And at the same time, we've also still designed really cool products, like the node chair for steel case. Closer to home, I think some of you may have experienced this at some point in the past couple of years. We helped the Ministry of Manpower design a service experience that feels easy, a little more human, and a lot more efficient as well. So this is some of the work that we've done at IDEO. But today, I'd actually like to talk about a personal story um, my journey on how, what, is, what, is, what, what are the experiences in my life that have brought me to where I am today? And what are the things that have shaped my perspective on the work that I do every day? And why I feel that's important to me personally? So if you will, chapter one is identity. And why I try not to take myself too seriously. So I grew up with an ambiguous sense of identity. You know, I went to an all boys school until I was five. And here's the thing about going to an all-boys school. Um, the one with the longest eyelashes is usually the one who plays the part of the girl. Um, so that was me. Um, so I dressed like that pretty often. Uh, it didn't help that during Christmas, when my mom was buying gifts for my cousin sisters, I would be the lead model to try out everything, see if it's working out. Um, and that during school dress-up competitions when all my friends would come as warriors and princes and superheroes, my mom would channel her inner horticulturalist and turn me into walking flora. <laughs> so this was my childhood. I moved to Singapore when I was... I moved to Singapore when I was five, not knowing much about the country that I had just left. And I ended up going to an international school over here where 
every year you'd get new friends and your friends would leave and there's like so much change in your life all the time. And you have friends from all around the world and you don't, really don't get a sense of like, oh, I'm from one particular place. You start feeling like you know people from all over the place. And you start imbibing their ways of life, their cultures, their kind of tastes, the things that they like listening to, the things that they like eating. And I thought this was really normal, that this was how everyone was growing up. And I realized it was not normal when I moved back to India when I was 11. Suddenly I felt like an outsider. I was suddenly part of a group of people who had all grown up together in one tight community when they were kids. And I was like, wait, who's this guy who has like no idea what these guys are talking about? Um, and yeah, I felt pretty lost because I felt like I'm this outsider who had come into a, like almost like a tribe, bringing with me all kinds of bad influence like, you know, punk rock music and death metal and really violent PlayStation games. And of course, like this is cool for the first few months. Everyone's like, oh, the new guy and he's bringing all this cool stuff that we've never seen. And it gets old in like three months. And then you just become the only Indian kid in class who actually does not speak an Indian language. Um, and here's a pro tip for you guys. If you, if you learn French all your life and move back to India, it's pretty useless. <laughs> so all this moving around f made me feel pretty lost. You know, I was like trying to figure out who I am and how do I fit in. And I felt like when I went back to Singapore a couple of years later, I met some of my friends and they had become completely different people. And I couldn't really identify with them. And then there were these people back at home where they've grown up with very different experiences than I have. And I'm just like, I don't feel like I can connect with them either. And I went through like a little bit of an existential crisis. I'm like, who am I? Where am I from? And how do I connect with people? And I think at this point, I figured that, you know, I need to stop taking myself so seriously. And maybe I just lighten this mood. You know, growing up, dressing up as bumblebees and sunflowers, didn't do much for my self-esteem, to be honest, but um, they seemed to make people around me happy. And I was like, maybe that's something I can do. Just, I can connect with people by making them laugh or just making them happy. So this is what I would do. I would audition in the most embarrassing roles in school plays like Mustard Seed in Midsummer Night's Dream and completely make a fool out of myself in most situations. And I was very intentional intentional about my journey to becoming class clown. And I can remember almost every single parent-teacher meeting where my mom would come in and the teacher would say the same thing. Like, this guy's playing the fool, he's a class clown, he doesn't take his studies seriously, he's just making people laugh all the time. And I was like, yes, that's, a, that's, a, that's what I want to do. I'm doing well. And I was like, yeah, this is who I want to be. This is how I connect to people. And this quote really resonates with me, that through others we become ourselves. And I strongly believe that identity is not something innate. It's not something that can be formed or defined in a vacuum. It's something that's, I mean, your, your personal identity is the product of the experiences and the environment that you, you're in. And it's the way that you relate to people around you. It's the way that you relate to the world. So this is something I really believe. So chapter two is Ragnarok and how I discovered the joy in creating things. Has anyone ever played an MMORPG over here? One? Do you know what an MMO, do you know what the MMORPG stands for? Yeah, it's a massively multiplayer online role playing game. And I started playing this MMORPG called Ragnarok in 2004. Looking back at it today, it seems like a really crappy game. I mean, you're walking around like stabbing pixelated pink bubble monsters like this. But I was addicted to the game, and um, I just lost myself completely in it. But more than spending time on the game, so the thing about our online role-playing game is that there are like thousands of people who are playing it at the same time, and there's like a huge community around it. So more than playing the game itself, I started spending a lot of time on the online forums. We would chat about the game and chat about all kinds of stuff. And that's when I first discovered signatures. So if you don't know, signatures are much like the ones you have on emails, except on gaming forums, they look crazy. So they're like this. At the end of all your posts, you have your character and your name and like all this cool looking stuff and like dead people and whatnot. And 15 year old kid is like, wow, this is so cool. I, I want to do that. I want to make one of these. 
and I had no idea how. So I would ask people and, and they would just like, be like, yeah, man, Photoshop, obviously. And I have no idea what Photoshop is. It sounds really confusing and like, do you have to pay for it? Is it, is it hard to learn? And I'm like, oh, I, I don't know what this is. So I turn to the one software that I feel like all of us know how to use. I go to MS Paint. <laughs> um, remember, remember the masterpieces we used to make on MS Paint? Well, I was like, you know what? I know how to use this software, so I'm going to fake it till I make it. Um, so I would start taking screenshots of my game and erase out the backgrounds and take out my character and put all my characters together and put a little border around it. And I was like, oh, that's my signature. But this didn't look cool. This wasn't like anything like the other guys were doing. So over time, I started experimenting. I would, I would crop out pictures of my favorite desktop wallpapers and put them in the background and put my characters on top and make a little border. And the more I made, the more I experimented with new kinds of fonts, new kinds of layouts. And I felt like I was getting better at it. I was getting a grasp. But at the same time, as I started uploading, the, uploading these to the internet, I started getting response from people. People were like, hey, that's really cool, man. Did you make that on Photoshop? I'm like, no, I made it on Paint. <laughs> um, but people started appreciating my work. And for the first time in my life, I was actually creating stuff that I was putting out in the world. And people were actually seeing it, appreciating it, responding. Um, people were actually asking me to make signatures for them. And I was like, this is so cool. Like, people want my stuff. So not before long, I was starting to make signatures for entire teams in the game like this, which you can't really see right now, it's kind of blurry, but starting to push what I could do on this software by having many different characters, different kinds of backgrounds, layering multiple things on top of each other. And this is not easy, by the way, this is paint. There's no layers on paint. <laughs> so yeah, I was pushing myself to see where I could take this, and I was getting immense joy out of doing this kind of work because people are getting joy out of it, and in turn, that made me really happy. And as time passed, I started making even more complicated ones, where I would zoom in to the picture and paint everyone's clothing the same color, like pixel by pixel, so that it all looks the same, and they look like they're part of the same team. And of course, over time, I'm like, I need to be funny. I need a creative outlet for my humor. So I started making Ragnarok comics and uploading that to the, to the internet. And people would be like, hey, that's really cool. Can't wait for the next one. And I started getting this kind of feedback that made me really happy. I'm like, this is awesome. I love this. Up to this point, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just fooling around on paint, you know, just making some random screenshot artwork. I have no idea what it's even called. And at some point, someone mentions that, hey, you're, 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 like, you're a graphic designer? I'm like, huh? What's that? So I Google graphic design, and it blows my mind. I'm like, whoa, you can get paid for this. <laughs> this is a profession. This is like a real thing. Awesome. I want to be a graphic designer. You know, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go tell my family that I want to be a graphic designer. Uh, OK. I feel like at this point is where I introduce you to my family. <laughs> so chapter three, the Josephs and the Thomases, and how I had to come to terms with my brain and the brains of others. Now, I feel like before I start this, I need to address something that a couple of you might have wondered at the beginning. I know when Grace introduced me, she said, George Joseph. There's like this look of confusion on some of your faces. Like, hey, why does this fellow have two first names? <laughs> um, long story short, it's a weird familial naming algorithm that we have in the Syrian Christian community in Kerala, where my family's from. And it's got something to do with inheriting one set of grandparents' names and the other set of grandparents' names. But it clearly does not have a robust enough set of guidelines. Because if you think George Joseph is a weird combination, you should meet my cousin. Matthew, Matthew. <laughs> In fact, you should meet his cousin, Abraham, Abraham. <laughs> they have cool names. Anyway, um, this is my family. And like most kids would say that they're really influenced by their parents and that they've played a big part in their life. But I'm, no, I'm not going to say anything different. My parents have been really in inspirational and influential in my life. I spent a lot of my childhood watching the Oprah Winfrey show with mom. And I've learned a thing or two about empathy from her. She is one of the most caring, generous, and empathetic people I know. And it was kind of inspiration to me growing up that you could actually live a very fulfilling life by living it to serve others and just 
always making sure that other people's needs are more important than yours. My dad is an extremely smart man, um, the kind of guy who only reads nonfiction books, uh, always has something to talk about at dinner table conversations. And for me, this was just like this inspiration that life is about being curious, and there's no end to curiosity. There's no end to how much knowledge you can attain, that you should always be questioning what's happening in the world, what are things that are interesting, like what can I learn something new about. And it was also kind of scary, intimidating, because my dad was just so much smarter than I was, and I just felt so intellectually inferior to him. And not just my dad, I mean, if you look around my family, at this point in my life, my brother was going on to be an applied biomolecular technologist. I have this uncle in the UK who's this prolific cardiothoracic surgeon. And I had to practice pronouncing all these words last night. Um, I have a grandma who's a biology professor. I have family who's in pharmaceuticals, in engineering, in dentistry, in like, medicine. And all around me, I've grown up with people who are just so bright and have this insane uh, ambition in their careers and they're so academic and like it's it's crazy like I just don't identify with that because over here you have this kid who's zooming in to paint and painting pixels <laughs> saying that he wants to be a graphic designer um, yeah and I just didn't relate to this world of like academic excellence and always wanting to be the best in my class I was an average student um, at this point in my life my one goal in life was just to make people laugh um, didn't have these great expectations for what I would become. So, I'm just like, you know what? And wait, by the way, like this is something that I'm sure a lot of you in this part of the world have experienced, that society has certain plans for us, um, certain expectations of who you need to be when you're a kid. And like, you need to be an engineer. I'm like, yeah, I need to be an engineer. And of course, everyone knows that the science stream is the most superior stream, right? So I was like, yeah, I'm going to take the science stream. I'm going to be a civil engineer. You know, I'm going to make some bridges. And I, I did the science stream. And then this kind of happened. Um, yeah. Three on 70 was probably one of the lowest scores that anyone has ever got in a physics exam in my school. I was breaking records at this point. <laughs> and I think it finally dawned upon me that, you know what, maybe I shouldn't be an engineer. I don't think you want me to design your bridges. Uh, it's not really working out. Um, and I was just reflecting. I'm like, I can spend hours upon hours sitting in front of the computer just making sure that what I'm creating looks perfect and that I'm using the right fonts and I'm telling the right story that I want to tell with whatever I'm doing. But I couldn't even spend 10 minutes in front of a chemistry textbook trying to learn formula. And I think this for me was like, OK, I need, to, I need to focus on this, and I need to say that this is what I wanted to do. And that's what I would do. I would tell my parents after many tough conversations and long chats saying that I really want to be a graphic designer, and I feel like this is what I want to become. And I mean, yeah, long, long chats. Um, which brings me to chapter four, string theory, and how everything started connecting. So this, I'm at the tail end of my schooling. I'm, I'm not feeling really smart. I'm one of the worst students in my class. And I was like, I need to get smarter. You know? like, I need to learn more. So I went to my dad, and I asked him, can you recommend some books for me to read? You know, like, what, would you, what would you recommend me from your bookshelf? And he hands me The Elegant Universe by Brian Greene. If you're not sure who that is, he's one of the leading theoretical physicists in the world who writes a lot about string theory and super string theory. Who gives a 16-year-old a book about string theory? It's like, are you serious? So I take this from my dad, and I, I'm like, oh, great book, great book. And I'm pretending like I understand what's happening. It all goes over my head. But over time, I asked my dad to recommend more books. And he's like, Can you, what else should I read? You know, anything else? And it went on for a couple of years. I'm finally in design college. And in my second year, my bookshelf has like books by Dawkins and Hawking and all these people. And finally, my dad comes and recommends a book that's finally not about the cosmos. He gave me The Art of Innovation by Tom Kelly. So Tom Kelly is an author of some of the most well-known books about innovation. He's a partner at IDEO. And his brother actually founded the firm. And he comes to me and he's like, 
I don't know what you're doing with all this painting and drawing, whatever that you're doing in your college, but you know, if you join a company, I think you should join this one. And at that time, I was like, I want to make posters, I want to make album art and stuff. But I read the book, and I was like, oh, this seems really interesting. And my dad's curiosity had finally entered the design industry. You know, he's like reading about it, and he's trying to get smart about it. And he's helping me find my way based on the things that he thinks is interesting, the things that he values. And he kind of knew that I value internally as well. I just didn't know how to express it. So I joined IDEO four years back. And it's been a pretty wild ride. I've got to spend time at three of the firm's locations, in Munich, in Mumbai, now in Singapore. And I've got to do some pretty amazing work. I've moved on from making signatures in paint. Talking about curiosity, learning about new, new things, starting all your projects with empathy. A couple of years ago, we started working with a global pharmaceutical company to really help them define what their brand meant beyond just their visual expression, like their identity and the collaterals. We helped them really figure out how their brand could inform the, inform the work that they do every day, inform the products that they're actually making, and inform the way that they engage with their customers, their employees, and really change the way they function as an organization. And I thought that was really powerful. Talking about putting your work out in the world and seeing people use it and seeing how people react to it. We recently prototyped a service in rural India for farmers to have a new way of earning income. And it's such an amazing feeling to, to design stuff for people who don't even speak the same language as you, to put it in their hands, to explain stuff to them. And as a communication designer, there's such a fulfilling thing when, when you've drawn a simple comic explaining a service and someone gets it. And you don't need to explain it to them in words. You don't need to like, have an entire like, deck about what this thing is about. Through simple visual storytelling, you've managed to communicate an idea. And I think that's incredibly powerful. So, oh, by the way, we've, we've shared a bunch of these stories from this project on, on IDEO's Instagram page. So you can check out the Teams Amin hashtag to catch up on some of the stories that we've shared. So a couple of things that I've learned across my journey, that I've learned to be true, that have stuck with me on this entire path to becoming a designer and joining a firm like IDEO. I want to share that with you. One is that identity is a complicated thing, and that you should embrace it and learn from it. You know, from dressing up as fairies to feeling like an outsider in your own country, I think everyone's got feelings for why they feel they're weird or interesting. And I feel like you can learn from that if you just embrace it, if you just allow that to help you shape who you are. That there's gold in understanding how you connect with your gene pool. I mean, most people feel like they're the black sheep of their family in some way or the other. But I feel like when you finally understand the strings that connect you about what you value as, as a shared people, like whether it's your dad or your mom, what do you really care about? It can really help you define who you are and who you should be, and what are you actually moving towards. And that finally, there are unlikely paths that can lead you to discovering what your passions are really. I was really glad that I got addicted to that crappy computer game, you know? Because if it wasn't for that, I don't think I would be here. I wouldn't have discovered this world that I didn't even know existed at the time. And Steve Jobs talks about this, that you can only connect the dots looking back, and that at that point, there was no way that I could have predicted in the future that I would do this, and then I would go to college, and then I would work at a company like IDEO. But just being open to the fact that the experiences in your life can actually form who you are and change your life, I think that's a really powerful thought. And finally, don't pose with fake rhinoceroses. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, George. I'm going to take some questions from the audience, if anybody's brave enough to put up their hand. I'll kick it off. OK. OK. So you happily stumbled into your passion through uh, gaming and design. 
And I think passion is kind of a trendy word right now. Everyone's about pursuing your passion. But what advice would you give to someone who's pursuing their passion but is, you know, not quite excelling at it? Mm. I don't know if I was excelling at graphic design at any point in that journey. Um, I feel like one thing is that I never called it a passion at that point. Um, I never said that that was going to be what my life was all about. And I think that some people want to define what their passions are and then pursue that. And I feel like if it's something that interests you, if it's something that makes you happy, if it's something that you derive joy out of, I think that's all that matters. And then you will eventually find meaning out of that. You will find a career, a fulfilling career out of it. Um, and you will get to where you want to be without actually saying that this is my passion and these are my plans, my like five-step plan to how I'm going to achieve that passion. I think that's a different way of looking at it. Hi. <clears throat> Thanks a lot for sharing. Just a simple question. Um, so if you were not a graphic designer, what slash who else could you be? I would be a really terrible civil engineer, probably. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, w I mean, it's, it's your friends and your family around you telling you that you need to be an engineer and stuff. So I, I, there was one point in my life where I really thought I was going to be an engineer, and I mentally accepted the fact that this is what I wanted to do. And I think it's only when I started doing really badly in school, I'm like, I'm terrible at this, and I don't want to do this. Um, I think the next thing, the next logical jump was like, oh, maybe I should do architecture because that's somewhat more creative. And, but I eventually realized that this is what I, what I cared about deeply and this is what I wanted to do, so. Cool, thank you. Now that you're doing graphic design, <coughs> what do you intend to achieve in it in the next decade or something, given that things change so much in the industry? Um, that's a tough question. Uh, I, think I'm, I think I'm doing some pretty interesting work right now. As a graphic designer, I feel like working in a place like IDEO, you get to really explore different kinds of things. So I'm not solely working on graphic design related projects. The fact that we work in teams and work on big challenges allows me to actually work on really complex things like agriculture in India or, or the pharmaceutical industry, for example. And I feel like I want to continue pursuing that for a bit. Um, yeah, and eventually, I'm, I'm really, I wouldn't say passionate, but I really want to start working in the education space. It's something that I'm really excited by. It's something that, like, I've had a, I don't know, I don't know if it's terrible or great education experience growing up, but I've had a, a certain type of education experience that I feel like doesn't really promote certain kinds of industries or certain kind of craft. Um, they have a sole focus on certain types of things, and I, I want to be part of like changing that mindset. So, uh, my question is education based. Uh, you you mentioned that you were setting up a school. You set up a school from the ground up, the building, the materials, the uh, the <coughs> curriculum, everything. Going with that, and your experience of uh, being in school, both in Singapore and India, and also with the almost like the tiger mom philosophy that you've got to be good at three good things. You've got to be good at one good sport, pick one sport, be good at that. Pick an art, be good at that, whether it be violin, piano, ballet, whatever, but be good at it. And then the third is academics, pick one and be good at it. And it doesn't matter if you're not liking it because the philosophy is if you do it hard enough, long enough, you'll eventually be good at it and then you'll like it. So my question to you, is with that philosophy, and a lot of philosophy is, is that philosophy is here, how do you make the bridge to th that thinking and to encouraging creative thinking on another side where you're coming from? I think it's just a question of giving equal importance to all three. I like what you said that you actually prioritize doing a sport, doing an art, and doing something academic equally. I just feel like most schools don't do that right now. I feel like the schools that I've been to prioritize academics before anything else. That you don't need to be a part of a sport if you're doing well in, in studies. That you don't need, like most, most of our courses in India, they drop off an arts course by the time you're 13. It's like deemed as not important in the, in the rest of your career and the rest of your education. 
And I feel like if you give that equal importance to, to students, they will be able to discover that they have passions in different places. They will be able to grow themselves as creatives or as different kind of thinkers. I feel like most education systems try to form a certain type of person. And that's, that's the challenge that I had faced in my, in my school as well. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much morning. for the presentation. Uh, so early on Friday morning. Uh, so how many careers do you think you'll have in your life? You know, how many? Careers, you know, different jobs or whatever you call them. And you said you want to move into education space. You know, who do you think you'll be there? Like what, what your role would be in, in an education space? So funny enough, the next project that I'm working on in IDEO is actually an education related project. And I feel like we're going to be helping create a school from the ground up in Asia. And I don't know much about designing for education, but I feel like being on that project will really help me understand more. And I've always had a hunch that I want to be in the education world, either teaching or designing new kind of curriculums for, for students. Um, but I have nothing to back, back me up and say that I, I'm credible at this and that I know what I'm doing, right? So I feel like getting to work on a project like that will really help me. And I, I guess I'll take it from there. I might realize during that project that I want to join a school and I want to be full time into this job. So I don't know. I'm not sure about how many career changes I expect. I hope many. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Um, I'm uh, like you, a good student. So I went into finance 20 years ago and said, oh, this industry is becoming like a car industry, algorithms and compliance and processes. And I discovered my breath of fresh air was a, a business we cover about uh, design thinking. And I was like, oh, you can be creative and manage constraints, you know, try and replicate something yeah. creative. And my question is, design thinking is becoming, it made the cover of Harvard Business Review. It's something really that What's your feeling working at IDEO, which is at the forefront of this change from designing things to designing whole services and experiences and practically a form of strategy? How have you felt over the past four years that there's been increasing attention? Have you been feeling it? I have been feeling I mean, I think it's really cool. Um, and that's one of the big reasons why I wanted to work at a place like this. Um, mm -hmm. Our founder keeps talking about how we are now sitting at the big boy's table. You know, like earlier, earlier creatives were seen as like these, these funky people doing some things over there and they make cool looking stuff and they give it to us. And I feel like now we actually have the credibility to sit with CEOs of companies and help them define strategy for the company. And I feel like that's really powerful. Um, and it's a world that I wanted to be part of because I feel like when you're in that position where you can actually inform an organization on how to, to do things differently or change the way they work. That's a really powerful place to be as a designer and that you can actually create massive impact by, by being at that level where you can actually do so many things. So. Any other questions? Sorry. Oh, way back. Hi. Um, my question is, if you could talk to the boy who's dressed up as a flower, <laughs> what would you tell him? Um, don't be embarrassed right now, it'll work out. <laughs> yeah. I went as a flower like against my will, honestly. I didn't want to be a flower, my mom thought it would be funny. So. All right, I'm going to take one last question. Thanks. So my question is more about uh, design and communication and that intersection and thinking beyond just the, the projects that you do at IDEO. You know, what responsibility, especially as a communication designer in doing the cool projects that you do at, at pharmaceutical companies or with farmers, you know, what element of uh, the communication strategy do you think about sustainability and going beyond kind of just the project and how a good service for farmers or a good strategy at a pharma company is, is going beyond the project, is outliving the project, and what role does a communication designer play in that process? Yeah, um, especially with the pharma work that we did, um, I think this is also, it's my mic on, yeah. Uh, I think it's also the way we work at IDEO with our clients. We work really collaborati co collaboratively with them. So 
they are part of this entire process with us when we're actually working on the projects. And it's not like one day we just turn up with a whole bunch of deliverables and cool looking assets and say, here you go, take it forward, bye-bye, and then leave. I think we work together to form sustainable ways of implementing all the work that we've done. Um, as a communication designer for that work, we actually created three books um, that defines what the brand essence is about, what the brand identity is about, what the brand experience is. And these really gave very clear guidelines and, and suggestions on how you can actually bring that strategy to life. So it was less about just showing cool visuals and saying that, hey, this is your, this is your brand strategy. Have fun. It was more about actually seeing how they would implement that over time, over the next couple of years, in fact, and how they could actually start implementing that on a day-to-day -day basis on, in terms of like across their entire org, like their products, their services, their interactions, um, everything. So. Warm round of applause for George. Thank you all so much. <laughs>